Today is July 26, 2006. I am Jessica Clark. It is a pleasure to conduct this interview for the Dakota Memories Oral History Project in, is, you say Crono? Crono, that's Crono? right. Uh, Crono, Saskatchewan. To start, can you please state your full name? My name is Mona Rosa. Was Wettstein is Lipey. Okay. And Mona, where were you born? I was born actually in Regina in a hospital. I was modern already. Was that common back then to be born um, in Regina? Or? Well, uh, I think um, I think all of us were born there, and I have older sisters, so yeah, it must have been already by then. But there were others that were born at home yet too. Okay. How far about is Regina from? About 20 miles. Okay. Um, and when were you born? December the 30th, 1934. Okay. Just skipped into that year. And have you ever heard an interesting story about your birth? Yes, actually, <clears throat> in those days there wasn't much in the line of uh, car travel and those kind of things. So my dad shipped mom off to Regina to stay with her two sisters when the time was getting near because of snow and snow banks and lack of being able to travel. So she stayed with them and um, I guess was uh, having some trouble during the night already. And the next day uh, the two sisters took her, one in each arm, and they walked her to the hospital like about five or six blocks. And I was born at about noon. share with us some of your earliest childhood memories? Uh, a lot of them were very lonesome years because my sister was eight years older than I and so I was kind of like an only child and uh, I remember playing a lot of things by myself and inventing things and imagining things and um, those kind of things that um, and of course, I, I really enjoyed books, and uh, so I learned to read early, and I was anxious to go to school, and school was a very important time for me. I, uh, holidays were kind of a nuisance. <laughs> you say you enjoyed reading. Were you reading in German or in English? Um, I think it was uh, into the English, although I spoke German, and I knew some English, uh, which was certainly a help when we got to school. Uh, some of them didn't, and really, some funny stories about those things, you know. But I, I never did have a funny story about not knowing the language. But my sister, you see, was eight years older, so of course she would speak English to me, and and... I would uh, have known the language better. So how many children were in your family? There was just three of us. Um, my, well, actually four, but there was, uh, my sister was eight years older, and then we had a sister in between there that um, died of tonsillitis, and they didn't have penicillin in those days, and she died from it, the inf inflammation of it when she was uh, about a year old. And then, of course, I came along, uh, and then we had a brother who was 11 years younger than us. So that's why I was an only child, and so was he. <laughs> Can you, what, are, what were their names? My oldest sister is Vera, and then <clears throat> Hilda is the one that died, and our brother was Heinz. So was, did your parents intentionally spread out the children so far? No, that's when it happened. Okay. Um, you mentioned that growing up as a kind of like an only child, you would invent games or toys and things like that. Do you remember any of those toys that you would make or games that you would play? Um, well, uh, mud, like mud pies, we would make... Uh, like a little stir up a little bit of mud and then if you have um, I don't know the English word for it uh, <clears throat> there's a weed that has sort of a little top to it 
uh, we used to call them case bevelin. And then you would take this weed and you would fill the top full of mud, and that was our ice cream cones. So <laughs> yeah, that was kind of one of the things we did, inventive. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> um, do you remember anything else that you would do as a little girl for fun? For fun? Well, they told me I ran away a lot, so I, <laughs> uh, I was quite um, swift of foot and um, occasionally went out with, or wanted to be with my dad out in the field. I would run away <clears throat> to be with him, and of course sometimes he wasn't in that field. So they were doing some hunting jobs for me. <laughs> oh yeah, my sister tells me that I was really a naughty child, I guess. But I grew up too. <laughs> uh, but just uh, walking. So you would run away from home and try yeah, to Yeah, uh, I didn't think I was running away from home. I think I knew what I, where I was going, but of course I didn't. And uh, then when they looked around, I would be gone. And Mother would, um, was a great gardener, and uh, I would eat more peas than, than and pick them, that's for sure. And so uh, she would often, because of that, when I was even younger, she would actually tie me to a tree so that she, uh, she could keep track of me. <laughs> uh, I don't remember that part of it, but they tell me about it. And uh, she'd, uh, when she went out to do the washing, like, and uh, because I was so quick, uh, she would tie me to the wash line, too. And <laughs> then, of course, she was able to find me when she was finished with whatever she was doing. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> so when you were growing up, since your sister, it was your sister, right? Your yep. older sister? Since she was eight years older than you, did she always live at home when you were growing up? Uh, oh down? no, she, what was I? Well, she was 16, so I was eight when she left. Uh, she went to Luther College, and so then I was by myself from there on until our brother was born. So, yeah, no, she wasn't around much. And she really, um, we really didn't get along very well because of the age difference. Uh, I think she kind of thought I was a nuisance, you know, how it is, you know, and this pesty little sister of hers. But, um, and it's... Uh, it's kind of strange because we've really never been friends until we finally got married and had children, you know, because she went away and I really didn't have much to do with her after that. And Regina was a long ways away in those days. The roads were poor and she didn't come home often. So. And your brother was born 11 years after you? Mm-hmm. So how, how did having any baby in the house. How oh, was that? I was thrilled to death. <clears throat> he was my toy. I just loved him. I, um, I would dress him up in all kinds of clothes and take his picture. And um, He was really a doll. I, he had red hair. And we don't have red hair in the family, but he had red hair. Do you remember how your mom told you you were going to have a baby brother? Uh, she didn't. Um, I uh, saw some baby clothes around, and I thought, hey, I think there's something going to happen here. And not too long after that, um, uh, she, I woke up one morning, the alarm clock was ringing on the steps, and I was sleeping upstairs, and I thought, what in the heck is the alarm clock ringing for? So I went down, and there they had gone to Regina. He was born in April, <clears throat> so he had taken her, uh, Dad had taken her to Regina. And then shortly uh, after um, school, I think it was, he told me then that I had a brother. So <laughs> that was, I was very excited about that. He is a sweetie boy. Do you remember how your responsibilities changed with the, with the new baby in the house? <clears throat> I don't think so. 
um, I don't know. I was just, uh, I didn't, you know, we didn't have to learn to do a lot of things. I don't know, Mom didn't really um, teach us to do a lot of things. She did them herself, kind of, and we went to school and read and wrote and played. And it was a great childhood. So you've mentioned that you really liked school. Oh, yes. How far was the school from your house? About uh, two miles. Let's see, a cr as the crow flies, it would only be one. But the way I had to go, it would have been about two. Okay. And was this a country school that you would attend? Yes, oh yes, a country school. We had up to 32 children at one point in time. One teacher, 10 grades. Some fabulous teachers, I'll tell you. The... Uh, they managed to teach us all, and we all really did well. And when we th went back in time and <clears throat> thought about all the children, we did a school book once, and all of the children that went through that school, although they may not have a high education, they all had good jobs, you know, uh, plumbers and tinsmiths, and there was all they were all... Um, well equipped for the world, shall we say. So they must have been very good teachers. You say um, teachers as in plural. Did you have a lot of teachers, different teachers every year? Or? Uh, oh no. Um, we had one for four years, I know, Mrs. Ulrich. And uh, then we might have had uh, maybe two year spells. Um, all told, I think maybe five teachers. Okay. So that's not too bad. Not too many for 10 grades. I took correspondence 9 and 10. Okay. So teachers, um, you mentioned that you did correspondence courses for grades 9 and 10. Was that something that a lot of students did back then? Yes, we did. Um, and I don't know. I don't think they do that anymore. But uh, you would uh, get the whole, whole um, course-like in a box and you would uh, fill out uh, certain lessons uh, per week and your, if you needed any help you would ask your teacher and then you would send it away uh, in a brown envelope and they went off to the uh, school in Regina and they were corrected and returned. So would you have to go to school Monday through Friday still? We did. Mm -hmm. Since school was um, so far away, what time did you have to head out to get to school? <laughs> Almost always too late is what I started out. Yes. I ran a lot of times <laughs> because I did it was how late. I, should, I hope my kids don't hear that part. <laughs> 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 yeah. And, oh, we used to go to school with a gig. Um, my cousin and uh, cousins, two of them, and another neighbor, they had uh, gigs. They, well, do you know what a gig is? Mm -hmm. It's a little cart with two wheels that hooks up to a, a horse. And uh, you sit in the cart, and they had, like, seats on both sides. And children would sit on this, and you would drive with this horse and gig to, uh, and I, but I had to run about a half a mile to get, to catch one of these. So, as I say, there was many times I ran to those corners to <clears throat> jump in the gig and go along with those kids. So then at school, then they had a barn for the horses? Yes, they, they did. Mm -hmm. We had a barn, a small one, but, uh, and they always brought a little bit of feed for the horse. And, the boys would go out and at noon or so and throw them something to eat. So can you describe what a, a one room school what the one room schoolhouse that you went to looked like? If you walk in, what how was it set up? When you first walked in it was sort of a, a porch which was quite large and that was then deemed as the boys uh, cloakroom. 
and then you went into the room itself and there was really nothing in that room except just one very large room and on the opposite side of this porch was also a room like at the back and that was the girls cloakroom so the, at, at the back of the, uh, of, of the school then we had the boys cloakroom where you came into then we went into the school and you went around the corner and over here was then the girls cloakroom in between was a library which was just sort of like a large pantry it was not very big and if we had a hundred books in there it was something else when I look at some of the libraries now, I think, wow. <laughs> and of course, we read those books three and four and five times, you know, that uh, they got well used. <laughs> Do you remember some of the books that you would read as a girl? <laughs> no, I don't remember them at all. What subjects were taught in school when you were going, growing up? Oh, well, we had math, of course. Uh, in English, and then there was um, social studies and science were usually two grades together, like three and four and five and six, and they would switch off so that if you went from one to the other that you would get the other half of it the next year. Like uh, if you studied Australia this year, you studied Africa next year, then they'd switch again so that, you know, everybody would get the full impact of that. And then we had, uh, on Fridays, we would have um, either a Red Cross meeting, showing how to do a meeting and that kind of thing, or we would have uh, like a craft kind of thing, and we learned how to knit and to crochet, and the boys would do uh, fret saw work and paint, you know, fret saw, you know what a fret saw is? It's a little saw with a very thin little blade on it and of course we had very poor wood at that time so we used apple box wood and stuff like that and they would draw a picture on that and then cut it out with this little fret saw and <laughs> paint them, made little door stops and match scratchers and a variety of things like that. But we did, uh, on spool knitting we learned and Music, we had a, uh, also a last, uh, usually Fridays, the last half, we would learn music, which I think is something that <coughs> is kind of missed today. Uh, but we were taught the notes and how to read music, and of course we sang a lot. Our teachers were quite musical, so they taught us a lot of songs. It was during the war years, and some of them are very nice songs that we learned because they were very prejudiced. Um, that was the war. Can you tell us how the war affected life for you? Well, we had, um, we all certainly knew about it because some of our uh, children had brothers and sisters in it. Not brothers, not sisters. Um, and we had um, like a stamp, a war saving stamp, that would be by, they were 25 cents. And since there was more of us than, uh, or less, depending on, on when, we would all put in a penny. And then one of us would get chosen and they would get that stamp for the day. So if there was more than 25 children that one got the stamp and then the the amount would go towards the next stamp. And so as a result, everybody eventually got these stamps, these 25 cent war saving stamps. That was our big donation to the war. But other than that, um, I don't think we learned much about it or that we heard much about it other than that I remember this, uh, these two brothers that were in the war. And these songs that we sang that I think are so terrible now. <laughs> so. so was it something that um, was kind of scary for you as a, a young girl to no. think that we were at war? or? No, I can't say that I ever felt fear about it. And I think maybe uh, the news media was not that 
much, you know, so you didn't really hear about it. Can you tell me about what type of activities the children did during their noon hour or recess hour? Oh, we played ball, of course, baseball. And uh, we would play pom pom pull away, uh, which actually was played inside the house, inside the basement. <laughs> when I think of that little basement, we thought it was so huge. And they'd line up on both sides and then they'd yell pom pom pull away, and we'd all have to try to get to the other side, and we'd get caught in the middle, and you know, all that. Uh, or we'd play may I outside. And What's may I? May I um, someone would be turned backward to the, his back to everybody that was standing here, and then he'd say, um, "Take three steps forward," and you'd have to say, "May I?" And <laughs> you would two years. He'd give you all kinds of things: big giant steps, baby steps, uh, scissor steps, a variety of kind of things that you'd have to do these steps in. Whoever got to the other end, of course, was the big winner. <clears throat> um, we also played, um, we called it football, but it's actually soccer kind of thing, game. Mm, what else did we play out there? We did a lot of physical exercise. They would take us out and we'd do exercise, you know, jumping jacks and all that kind of stuff. You mentioned um, playing ball or soccer, or what you call fo football. Um, what did you have equipment for that, like a baseball or a softball or? Oh yeah, we had a, a bat, maybe two, for the whole school, and a softball. And when it would split open, we would take it home and sew it up <laughs> with thread, and take her back out, and away we'd go again. Uh, I don't know if we ever got more than one softball a year. I can't remember. That was kind of the standard equipment when we started was you got a foot softball, now take care of it kind of thing, you know. And it was religiously brought in from the field when we, you know, removed ourselves from, you know, for recess or something like that or, or at the end of the school day. What about uh, gloves to catch the balls? Did you have gloves? Uh, those, those were your responsibility, and most of us had some things resembling our glove. And if you didn't, well, you know, you, there's two teams. You can always borrow from the other side when you're in or out. Um, what, if, um, a children, what if the children misbehaved? How would the teacher punish children? Well, uh, there were strappings, but um, not often. I don't think we really had a lot of misbehaving. Um, sometimes they had to stand in the corner. If they were smaller children, they would stand in a corner. But I did get the strap once. Um, we were being foolish, and uh, one little girl um, was sitting in the seat, and we took a little, you know, the, the string from flower bags, which is not really very strong, and we tied it to the back of our pants and to the desk, and then one of us went to the other end and called her, and of course she was tied to the desk. Oh, then she cried and cried and cried and cried, and the teacher wanted to know, what is the matter, and so on. And oh, we had tied her to the desk, etc., etc. Well, what a silliness that was. Anyway, he just had enough of us, and he said, okay, dear, get up here. And so he took a ruler, a very hefty ruler, and um, I don't know how many I got, maybe three or four good swats with that on the hands. And my cousin was the other one, and he wouldn't cry. So, of course, he got more than I did. And then he was, uh, she had listed a whole bunch of people, because she really didn't know who had done anything, and it wasn't anything in the first place. Uh, 
and then when the next girl was cra- called up, she said, I didn't have anything to do with it, and so he stopped. So that was the end of it. But I did have some very good marks on my hands. So when, when you would get in trouble like that, would they send a note home to your parents? or You didn't want one going home to your parents. <laughs> um, as I say, you, you really prevented that one because if you did, you usually got another one at home. Um, I remember my parents didn't give me a licking for this one. Uh, I sort of explained it to them and I think they understood or tried to anyways because I didn't get a spanking. So let's talk about your parents for a little bit. What, um, what is your mom's name? Rosa. Rosa. And can you tell me a little bit about your mother? Oh, she was a wonderful woman. Uh, she worked hard and baked and cooked. I don't know how she managed to do some of those things. She could make something out of nothing. Um, they had, you know, not all that much. But she was very capable of coming up with food for many people with very little. Uh, I just sit and wonder about that some days. And sometimes when we got company, and company would drop in, there was none of this invitation. Well, there was invitation stuff, but mostly they would just drop in. And they would come in the evening, and she wouldn't have anything to serve. So she would quickly go to the other end of the room and mix up a cake and bake a cake to serve for lunch. Like... How do you do that? <laughs> and um, like, and it was a good tasting cake too. I always loved it when they got company. <laughs> and she did uh, a lot of the farm work. She milked cows and tended the chickens. I remember they had this really lame pig one time. And uh, it was a litter, and the mother had kind of uh, ostracized it. So she said, can she have the pig? And they, sa- they said, okay, do with it what she wants. It's going to die anyway. So she dragged that little thing out into the sun, and she fed it <coughs> with a bottle. And that little pig grew up to be a full-sized one. And she, when, she, when they sold it, she actually got the money, and then she bought herself a set of dishes with it. And that, I've still got the dishes. Mm. <laughs> so I hate to get rid of them because of that story that goes with it, because she worked so hard for that. She was a very hard working. She had a huge garden. She could feed most of the neighborhood with that garden. What did she grow in the garden? What did she not grow in the garden? It would be easier, I think. Oh, there was potatoes and peas and carrots and beans. And and then there was extra little things like dill, where she would make dill pickles out of the cucumbers that she grew and the corn. And there was the other end had a strawberry patch yet, too. That's a huge garden for... Us. So did she make things like sauerkraut and... Indeed she did. And a lot of, um, of dough type of food. Food made with eggs and flour and milk because that's what was excess. It was easy to have. And a little bit of salt. You know, we had a lot of like knepfel and case noodle and those kind of things. And Knepfel was um, flour and egg and <coughs> and a bit of milk mixed together until it was sort of a, a good strong dough and a bit of salt in there too. And then we would put it into water and she would cut it into little pieces about this big and boil it in water until, um, it wouldn't take long to do that, and then she would... Uh, have made sausage or something and then she'd take some of that fat and put it over top of the noodle kind of thing 
She made her own noodles too with eggs and uh, flour and rolled them out, you know, very, very thin, just real sheets of them. Dried them, hung them all over the house and the back of chairs and whatnot all. And then chopped it up to make egg noodles. Um, yeah, she was a magician with food. And of course we always had to have meat. Dad liked his meat. So did you guys do your own butchering? Um, when I was much smaller, they used to have sort of uh, butchering bees closer to the winter time, uh, when they would go from one family to the next, and they would make uh, they would butcher like uh, a cow or uh, several pigs or whatever, and then they would uh, you know do that, everybody would help and make sausage and cut up the meat and hang it and the whole business. <clears throat> and then the following week they would go to the next neighbor and they would do that again. And so there was many hands made lighter work. And of course we always had chickens, so of course the eggs were real, uh, really helped with the noodle part. And then she would uh, make chickens and Again, before dinner, she would go out after breakfast and kill a chicken and pluck it and clean it and draw it, and it would be ready for dinner. And soups, she made that, a lot of soups too. Again, with the chicken, uh, would boil it and then use that water, and again, use egg and, and flour and make... Uh, like a, well, we called it Einlauf. Uh, my kids call it lumps, lump soups, because they like the, the lump part of it. And you would just sort of let it go into the hot water, and it would make kind of a lumpy soup. <laughs> Very delicious. Remember any of the other German dishes that she used to make? Mm. Well, always Kuchen, of course. Uh, there was, uh, when she made Kuchen, there would be like a stack of them. She would make many in a day. And, um, it, and like apple or with sugar or plums on it. Very good. Um, what other things which makes it, well, Bereshka, that counts kind of Russian, I think. I think our family came from Russia, so I think they probably had some influence from the Ukrainian or, uh, or Russian people there. So they would make some of the things that, you know, like the borscht soup, we would have borscht, and Bereshka, which is sort of a um, a bread with meat inside, you know, bake it. Oh, that was good. She made dumplings too. Um, over top of pork and sauerkraut and hawks. You're just making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so do you remember how your mom used to make sauerkraut? Yes, they had... Um, um, uh, what do you call it? A, a, to uh, to slice it. Uh, it's a machine. It's kind of a straight meat. Had a blade in it, and you put this cabbage head in it, and you would just run it over to the top. I can't think of the name of the thing. Crowd cutter, whatever. Anyways, and you would set the blade for whatever thickness that you would want it, and then you would set it over top of a wash tub. And uh, actually, ours had a little box. And you would put this cabbage head in there, and then you would run this box with your hand on top of it back and forth over this blade, and the cabbage would fall into the tub in the bottom. And then they would put it into huge crocks, like, what would they be? They were huge anyways. Um, and filled that full and kept putting it in salt, and then with a... It was a stomper. It's about yay big, 
and Sir Bacon had had a handle on the top and they used to stomp this down and then you know more cabbage more salt and stomp it down and then they'd let it sit and of course after a while you could smell it <laughs> and you could tell when it was ready to go <laughs> How long did it usually take for it to be ready to go? Well, you know, I really don't know, but I would think it would probably be about a month. I would think. No, I'm not sure, but but it took quite a while. Maybe it was just impatience on my part. I'm not just sure. <laughs> you just wanted some of that. Crowd. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and her dill pickles were to die for too. They uh, they would make them in those big crocks too. How did they do that? Um, it's quite similar, you know, they'd lay the cucumbers in and then they would put a brine over top of them and, um, and that, when they thought they should be ready, again you could almost smell when they were ready, uh, they'd go down there and feel around and bring some up, wash them, chop them up and there's your dill pickles. So besides kraut and, uh, sauerkraut and dill pickles, did your mom do other canning? Oh yes. Anything that was in the garden, she would can. Uh, we didn't have deep freezes. So she would can almost any vegetable that was there. And off times, she would put like um, five or six of the vegetables all in one jar, one huge jar, the two uh, quart ones. And that was like the soup to make soup with, you know, like a vegetable soup. And fruit. Uh, that fruit was bought, though, in boxes, and Dad would bring it home. And, and we always had peaches, I know. Some pears, but mostly peaches, canned peaches. Then I know she did, advent did get adventuresome and do some cherries uh, at times, too, but not too many. Did she make her own uh, preservatives like jams and jellies and things like that? Hmm, that one I don't remember. No, I don't think she did. Rhubarb, that one we had lots of. And we had rhubarb jam. Would rhubarb be used for anything else besides jam? Oh yes, rhubarb used for pies and as a fruit. We just ate it out of a dish, like fruit. Um, when she did that, or she canned rhubarb too, she would can it with um, with a slice of orange, and that would sort of take the tartness out of it. It was really delicious. And of course, she baked with it. And then the other thing that was really good—I don't know whether that had medicinal or just plain. Um, our own minds or whatever it was, but she would use the syrup for cough syrup, like our cough, you know, if we coughed, she would give us rhubarb juice, like it was really thick, syrupy kind of juice off the rhubarb, canned rhubarb. And we always thought it helped, so <laughs> whether it really did or whether it was all up here, I'm not sure. <laughs> So do you remember any other home, home remedies that your mom used to have when you were growing up? Home remedies. Oh, mustard plaster, of course. Mustard plaster. You don't know mustard plaster? Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> mustard plaster is when you have a really bad chest cold. Or, and um, they would take a, a cloth and put take mustard and flour probably about 7 to 1 or 10 to 1 maybe um, mustard and then flour and they would mix it up with water and then they would put it over top of this cloth and then they would lay it on the chest and it well we used it in the hospital yet so it must have been a good thing um, and it was for colds, and like chest colds, real bad chest colds. And I know if you had um, a bladder problem, she would put a, some drops of um, sweet uh, spirits of uh, spirit of 
Nair? Nair? What was that? And she would put that in a glass of water, and we drank the glass of water, and it would help with, um, you know, if you had a bladder problem. Spirits of Nair? That doesn't sound right. And then uh, uh, for her eye, too, we sometimes your eyes would get runny and stuff. And it was kind of a alum, a bit of alum in water. And she had a little eye wash cup. It was just like a, almost like about this big. I think I have one downstairs. Um, and it, you would put some of that water in there and just put it in and then sort of, Put it back and open and close your eyes into that alum, and it worked. <laughs> well, I can't think of anything else that we, what we got sick about. Coughs and colds, I suppose. Did anybody during your childhood get seriously injured where they had to go see a doctor or ill? No. I once as a child was doing some more of my running and uh, I ran into a field. I was, I think I was going out or somebody was, either there was something chasing me or I was going out to my dad's. <coughs> and uh, they had a barbed wire, just one wire. And I ran and didn't know the barbed wire was there or didn't look or anyway, and it caught me and uh, it, ripped a hole out of my paw, out of my cheek. <clears throat> and I went home and mum slapped it down and put a bandage over it and I don't know what kind of a disinfection she used but I have a little bit of a scar here and that's all there is. <laughs> that I know but so we didn't go for stitches for anything that that minor. Oh. Um, I can't remember that we had many accidents of anything, you know, really needed um, doctor's care. Of course, there was sickness, you know, mom had gallbladder attacks and that kind of thing. And that, of course, they would get to go to the hospital, but nothing like with accidents. And our little brother, like I told you, my sister died with tonsillitis. And then when he was six months old, he had tonsillitis too. And my mother was just out of her mind. And I couldn't understand what in the heck is the matter with her that she's so upset at this kid has got a sore throat. Well, she remembered very well what had happened to her previous child. But there was the sulfa drug then already. And he had took sulfa drug. They gave him sulfa drug, and he recovered. So, your mom, were you close to her when you were growing up? Yes. She's a very special lady. What types of things would you do with her as a, as a little girl? <clears throat> you know, really nothing to be honest with her, just be with her. No matter, she would talk to me and we, you know, mostly I'd sit around and watch while she cooked and, and baked and sewed and all those kind of things. Did she teach you how to bake and sew? No. It was all osmosis. <laughs> Growing up, did she speak English with you or German? No, she spoke German to me. German. So did Dad. What was your dad's name? Jacob. Jacob. And can you tell me a little bit about him? What type of a father was he? He was, um, he was a farmer who shouldn't have been a farmer. He did, he did his work well, but he never liked it. What he really liked was music, and he would, uh, he taught him 
himself to play many instruments, uh, whatever he could sort of get a hold of, and he would teach himself music. He didn't know notes either, but he learned. I don't know how he actually learned that, but he did. <clears throat> and he could play a variety of things, and the one he liked best was a trumpet. And he, uh, when we were, let's see, how old would I have been? Maybe about eight. He got a band going in the Krona area. And he, first of all, taught my sister and I to play. <clears throat> the very few years that we were together. Uh, and he himself and the three of us played through diff three different instruments. And so we played one time in church at some kind of a oh, missions fest or some darn thing. can't remember, but it was just at church. And a lot of people heard it, and then they thought they maybe liked their children to play too. Well, that was quite up his alley. And it was during the war years, and it was very difficult to find instruments. So would he went to no end um, to find used instruments for these parents to buy for their children. And we had a little band that would be, I would say, maybe even about 30 children from our community. And we played mostly hymns and simple uh, marching kind of music it was nothing fantastic, but it was really something for our community because, you know, we all learned to to uh, read music and we all learned to play an instrument. And he did that for quite a few years until the children sort of grew and left home for college, you know. It got smaller and smaller. And then in the end, after we came back, uh, we were gone for quite a few years, and we came back and had our children. He started it up again in his senior years, and we played with another group in Regina, again playing hymns and that kind of thing. So music was really something he loved to do. What instrument did you play when you were growing up? I usually played bass. I uh, started with a euphonium, and then I played the E-flat bass. We both took music lessons, too, my sister and I. Uh, our pastor taught us to start off with. He was able to play, and so he taught us how to play. Uh, and I got to about grade four, but it was not really something I loved to do. I played because I had to. <laughs> I'm glad I know it, but, uh, you know. So were you close to your father when you were growing up? Um, he was always around, and uh, I would, I think maybe, um, I did maybe more things with him than others might have, because <clears throat> I think maybe I was maybe a spoiled, maybe a bit spoiled a child because of my sister's death. You know, she was like, the she died, and then a year later I was born. And so as a result, I think I got away with a lot of things that maybe young kids wouldn't have, um, simply because they, I don't know, they were afraid or whatever. But I, I remember, <laughs> uh, you know, giving him hairdos and putting curlers in his hair and, and uh, you know, then they had the, the suspenders where they were attached, and I would take them off and pretend I was milking a cow. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> and then you'd go to the other side and milk that side, you know. <laughs> I guess he was very tolerant and very patient. Who was the stricter one, your mom or your dad? I would say neither was very strict, but uh, um, I would say uh, mom did the disciplining. And what was disciplining at home like? 
Well, I think you just got a spanking. That was it, kind of. It was never done publicly, and she did it with her hand. Uh, I recall <laughs> one time I was supposed to learn my catechism, and of course I didn't. And uh, fooled around, fooled around, fooled around. Anyways, she had enough of me, so anyway, she took me out into the porch, gave me a good spanking, and then I learned my catechism right smart. <laughs> You know, <laughs> that's all it needed. <laughs> Little inspiration. Inspiration, yes. <laughs> I don't know. They never, they never uh, demanded respect, but we respected them so much. And there was no way you would have said a nasty thing to them or talked back to them or like I hear sometimes today and I think... I don't know how they got that, but we sure never even dreamt of doing such a thing. And it's not that they would have really beat us or anything either, you know, they really weren't that kind of people. How they got that, I'm not sure. You know, we've talked a lot about your relationship with your parents. Do you know how they met each other? <laughs> yes. Well, we'll have to go a step backwards. My father's father had a wife and six children. Oh, there was seven, see, there was seven, seven children. Seven children. And at age about 32 or 34, the mother died. Then go back to my mother's side, and my <coughs> grandparents there had seven children, and they lived up in the young Watrous area. And the uh, father and his oldest son were hauling grain, and a little dog scared the horses, and then the son was sitting on the wagon, and and the horses ran away and the father attempted to hold them for fear for his son and fell over a long coat that he was wearing and his head went under a wagon wheel and he was killed. <clears throat> then my grandfather over here married the grandmother over there and brought her to Chrono with her seven children, and together they had another child. So that is how my parents met. It was not a good situation to do that. Imagine sticking seven kids of the same age together two years after their parents had died, their one parent had died. And then, when she had the fifteenth, when she had that fifteenth child, that mother died, and so he was left with fifteen children. And the great grandmother, like my great grandmother, their grand grandmother from my father's grandmother, age seventy-two, came to live with them to be sort of the house boss. And you can imagine who she might have favored. So how old were your parents when they got married? Um, 18 and 20 about. And how long were they married for? Until they died, which was, oh, well, over 50. Over 50 years. I don't know exactly how many years. Married in 24. I don't know. I have to figure it out. <laughs> and then they farmed in, the, in this area? <clears throat> yes. Uh, my grandfather then bought um, the property where I grew up in. He bought that property. The people moved away in to uh, California, and he bought that farm. And my father went and lived there for about a year or so before Mom went too. 
and that's where they lived for hmm, 40 years I think and uh, then they both had uh, health problems and so as a result they were ended up in in Regina one in a nursing home and my mother was in a, an apartment for a while and they both died of a heart attack so can you tell me what type of things your parents used to do for fun when you were a child when they weren't working what type of things did they do <coughs> Well, I think Dad would read or play his instrument, and like together, um, they didn't do much that I know of together. Uh, they didn't go away much, you know. They didn't go away. Period. They stayed at home, and so they would just do those kind of things. Mom would sew and and do household kind of things, embroider and and. But together, to, they went to church together. The church was just a quarter of a mile away, so that was always very important in our lives, was the church. And was the church a country church, or was it yes. a town? No, it was actually on our property, in the corner of one of our uh, sections, very near. Uh, they would uh, they would go visiting, that they would do, uh, quite often on a Sunday like after church, they would go to somebody's house. And, and of course, they had all kinds of people come to our house, too. And when you have that many brothers and sisters, there's always seemed to be one boarding there, too.